Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us for this uh, presentation. Uh, we're lucky tonight to have uh, Brian Maggart, Director of Special Programs uh, for the uh, Springfield Public Schools with us. Uh, I'm Chris Murray. I'm the Director of the Center on Human Development. And uh, a couple things. Generally, the way we set these up, uh, everyone is muted. Uh, and we did that to try to control any kind of Zoom bombing type of stuff. And also, uh, we do want, though, however, for you to ask questions. So we're hoping that you can type a question, any questions you have in the chat box throughout the presentation. And uh, then periodically throughout the presentation, we'll stop and, and ask Brian to respond to some of those questions. At the end of the presentation, Brian is providing his email address to anyone that might have some additional follow-up questions. So uh, we really appreciate you all coming. We're very grateful to Brian for him uh, spending this time with us. And uh, we hope that this is informative for you. So uh, welcome, Brian. Well, thank you very much, and thank you to everyone for having me. Um, I am the director of um, special programs, special education for Springfield School District, and um, I just I want to make sure that people know that I am speaking on behalf of you know the Springfield School District, and there are times that I'm going to be speaking directly about how this district operates and that's not necessarily applicable to all other districts of course in the state and i'll try to remember to clarify when i'm speaking about our practices versus what should be expected widely in high schools and in, in oregon um, i also just wanted to mention obviously this was a presentation that was prepared for september before school started but of course some fires and smoke got in the way of that presentation, unfortunately. So some of what I have in here applies to prior to school starting. And I can clarify a little bit of that as well, where um, you know some of the information might be applicable, even though we've started school, could make some sense when, not if, when we come back in person in January, and you can call me, um, a ridiculous optimist if you want to, but that's my expectation is that we are going to be back in person because I have to remain optimistic about that. But some of this will apply for when we do come back to a physical setting, not necessarily obviously because school has already started. So just a quick little bit about myself. I'm a special education teacher. Um, I'm, I still keep my license active even though I'm not actually teaching and I'm in administration now, but I went to the University of Oregon. I re received my master's degree at U of O and my doctorate. And I just, I really value the education that I was able to receive through the College of Ed. Um, and I had the opportunity to support students in, in academic areas um, at the elementary and middle school level and then supported students with social emotional behavioral challenges at the elementary level. But then after that, spent time case managing uh, students who did not fit into the traditional high school setting and really got to work with a lot of youth who were disenfranchised and marginalized. And that's where I got to learn a lot about the high school setting and expectations of students and expectations of teachers and adults in, in that setting. And, but the most valuable in the, in the recent years is that we have amazing teachers in our high school level in Springfield. And I've spent a lot of time with them learning about the high school setting and us really learning together about how to program better for students at the, in, in the high school ages, because it's complicated. And I'll talk a lot about how, how deep the knowledge has to go to make sure that our students are properly served. 
I have to mention that this should not be construed as legal advice. I think my legal representation would really want me to say this, that I am not a lawyer. I do not have a law degree. And a lot of what I'll talk about when I'm talking about the law is um, my current interpretation of the law. Um, but if you want to pay me $250 an hour for marginal legal advice, you can do that. But um, I, I think we would have some, um, you know, potential licensing issues with that. So, um, and then also keep in mind, some of what I'm going to talk about is about the physical setting and not in this strange world of comprehensive distance learning. And we're all still figuring out what this means to be in CDL and really what it means about the future of education and special education. So um, I'll try to, to keep distinguishing between those two as well. Okay, I'm finding my place in my notes so that I don't, so I'm less redundant than I normally am. And you can jump to the next slide for me. Actually go backwards. I think you flew too far. One more back. Right there, the, the one with the list. All right, so I want to make sure that we try to touch on four things and then I'll happily answer questions, like I said. First, I want to make sure that you understand some of the vocabulary that's used at the high school level and um, some different attitudes and, and people in different roles in, in comprehensive high school settings because it's different than the middle. Um, hopefully we can get an understanding of the, the supports that you should expect, how to request information and supports from people in the school setting. And then I'm going to talk about your role and responsibility as a parent and, um, and how that is, how it relates to the roles of counselors, teachers, administrators, and other folks who are interfacing with your child. Okay, now we can go to the next one. Just a quick quote, especially in this age of some violence. We'll use a quote with the word weapon in it, but I think properly used by Nelson Mandela. Education is the most important weapon which we, which you can choose to use to change the world, excuse me. Um, and this is an absolute truth in, in my opinion, and that's why we're all here. All right, next one. And I'm going to move awkwardly um, here and there because the light's on a timer and it doesn't like me to sit still. So please keep in mind, if you're not familiar with the high school setting um, and you don't understand something, you have to ask. And I think the folks who really have an understanding of the high school setting, they, and they're truthful about this, that no one really gets it the first time and most of the people who act like they really understand all aspects of a comprehensive high school, they are pretending. <laughs> so just remember that that's some, um, uh, you can't understand it all and you're certainly not gonna understand it the first time. All right, you can go to the next slide. Okay, so we're gonna jump into some nitty gritty right away. Um, credits mean something because it all leads to a diploma. The high school is different than the middle school because it is credit driven. And there are regulations around those credits. There's a certain number of credits you have to earn and there's a completion document at the end. You don't have to decide this right now, but it is something you need to be thinking about. And if your middle school IEP teams didn't talk to you about this, don't sweat it, don't lose sleep about it, but it is something you need to be thinking about and talking about with your teams. And I want you to know that um, in my opinion, and this is in Springfield and our expectation, but we're not there fully in practice, is that every team should be considering a regular or traditional diploma for a student when they first enter into the high school settings. That should be by default. And most of the time that makes sense. Sometimes it doesn't. And it's really important to consider all the possibilities for a completion document. But I do want you to know that for efficiency's sake, 
teams, especially at the high school level, tend to profile students and they put them into a category that they believe should be on a certain diploma track. And it's sometimes parents take that as, as an insult. And what I would tell you is don't, because it's all about efficiency at the high school level compared to elementary and middle, you have just such a large volume of students. If you think about, you know, just in Springfield, we have 12 elementaries feeding to four middle schools, feeding to two high schools. The math is pretty quick. There are a lot more students who are running through that, um, that funnel. And so high school folks have to be more efficient about their decision making. And I think if you want to think about it this way, at least I do in my head, and I, if I have this in my head on the front end, it makes it so that I don't take things as an insult that feel um, disrespectful. Elementary folks are more Northwest type of people. There are a lot of words that describe things. There's a, um, you know, much more affirmation about the, um, the feelings of others as they interact with each other. Um, high school people are more East Coast. There is a, um, there's an efficiency to interaction and it doesn't mean that there's a disregard for feelings. It just means that the communication is sometimes a little more direct because it's more efficient. So if you think about it that way, then hopefully you're not going to take it as an insult that your student was automatically put into a diploma track category when you haven't even discussed it yet. That said, when you are given this definitive answer of your child looks like this to us on paper and therefore is on this diploma track and you want to have a discussion about it, demand the discussion and be ready to ask some questions and I'll get a little bit further into that. Because um, you don't have to take that, that answer without having a discussion about it. Okay, next slide. So there are four of these completion or finishing documents. Um, there's a traditional diploma and the state calls it a regular diploma, but I still have trouble figuring out what regular is. So I call it a traditional. And then there's a modified diploma, an extended diploma, and those are all three state diplomas. Then there is a certificate of completion or certificate of attendance, and that is um, uh, a local decision about a certificate. So um, I just need to look at my notes for a couple of seconds. So like I mentioned before, the Regular diploma should be the default. And if there's a situation where your child is put on a modified diploma track and you believe that they should be on regular, or there's the thought of a certificate of completion as what their finishing document will be, and you think they should earn a modified diploma, demand the conversation. And when you have that conversation, you should be asking questions that really parses out what we're talking about, thinking about adult behavior in the school versus the nature of your student and the credits that you believe that they can earn. And if the answer to the question about why your student is on a certain track is more about the programming that is provided, and sorry, we just don't do that at this school, versus, well, um, we find it very difficult for students who have this academic profile to complete um, algebra without, uh, you know, without it being modified. Um, that, those are different conversations because if it's just about the, um, the programming and what is, um, what the focus of the program, what it allows for students to achieve in that setting, then you can have a deeper discussion about what you believe the range of services should be for your child. So getting deep into that is important if you think that your child should be on a different track than, um, than what the school thinks. But the, the refocus of all of this is this statement that I have under that list of diplomas. And the most important thing to think about is that you want to think about the long-term 
objectives for your child, what they want to achieve in life, what you want them to achieve in life. And we could be talking about workforce, two-year college, four-year college, trade school, military, further support from public school and vocational rehabilitation. What kind of living situation do you expect for your child when they're 18 years old? What do you expect when they're 30 years old? Um, you know, what kind of skills and opportunities do you, do you believe? Um, and that is really the crux of the conversation that needs to take place because um, that document all in all is really a piece of paper and it's leading to opportunities that happen beyond that secondary and post-secondary education. And um, that always, the conversation's always got to go back to that because I think there's sometimes a hyper focus on exactly which diploma when there hasn't been a full discussion about what the child really wants to accomplish. Um, but some of the bare bones, it's 24 credits for a regular diploma, 24 credits for a modified diploma, but one less in math and one less in um, English language arts. You have to pass essential skills, the state test in a couple of areas to get a regular and modified diploma. It's 12 credits for an extended diploma and um, it's really local options for that certificate of completion. Um, but I would say you really should start with the most difficult but realistic diploma type and try for that first. It's much easier to scale back a little bit in the future rather than try to jump from like if being on a modified diploma track and jumping back up to a traditional diploma track is much more difficult. Um, and also the decision is not final until the child starts to get a little bit too old. And that's just because um, services have to end at age 21. You know, that's the furthest out we can go. And, um, and you know, earning credits in a certain amount of time just becomes unrealistic. So you just have to keep that in mind that you don't have to make a decision that's final when the student is a freshman. All right, next slide. So uh, that's the last part of this first little section and I'm gonna move on to some support. So if, were there any questions, Chris? Brian, I have a couple that we received um, earlier, you know, prior to the meeting. So I'll ask one, uh, and I'll ask these throughout. And one question was, how will speech therapists work online with students who really need speech services? Do you want to do that after supports? Um, you know what, I'll, I'll speak to it in a general way right now. And, and maybe if the person who asked that question wants to resubmit some, um, some clarification to that, because the long and short is that all of our speech and, speech and language therapists in our district have um, jumped onto the teletherapy, into that teletherapy world. And they've used a lot of guidance from their national um, certification group to make sure that teletherapy makes the most sense for students. And I believe in surrounding areas that that's, that's the direction that speech and language therapists are going. Um, and I think it gets, it's complicated when it's speech therapy versus um, language and pragmatic language type of skills for students with social emotional or, um, or students who have autism, for example. Um, but the te teletherapy that I have seen is growing, growing in success. And I think they're really figuring a lot of things out around that. So I'll pause with that general and then there for follow up around speech therapy. Um, Right. then I can reach out to some speech therapists. Okay, one more question related to what you were just talking about. Uh, you know, many ninth grade students uh, don't have a clear understanding of their future. You know, I mean, just, that's a reality. And so, um, uh, how, how much are the consequences, how much does making a decision to go after one diploma or another 
how consequential is that in ninth grade versus 10th grade versus 11th grade versus 12th grade? Um, yeah, that's a good point. Um, so that's, that's why I was getting at that trying, uh, attempting for the most difficult, realistic diploma. So if, if a regular diploma is within reach at all, even if it's a stretch, I always encourage kids and families to, to try for a traditional diploma until we get into some modified credit issues. And I'm gonna go into that in a little bit. So, um, but by default, that's what kids and families should be thinking about is that, that modified diploma, or sorry, the, the most difficult diploma type that's within reach. So just really quickly on supports, there should not be a single special education program. There should be a full range of services, especially in a comprehensive high school, um, throughout the school, throughout the day, throughout the week. And again, I'm talking about in a normal time when we're actually in a physical setting, but there should be a range of services. All right, next slide. So, the one thing that you should remember is, and the, the services summary page in the IEP, that is gold, and you should always go back to that. There, it's, it's in this order. It's in specially designed instruction, accommodation and modifications, then related services, and then supports for school personnel. And on that page, you should find everything that you believe should be in place to support your student in that setting. And that can include additional classified staff in a bunch of settings, frequent check-ins with certified and classified staff, um, nursing and health services, and anything else that you have found to contribute to the student's success over the last several years of being on an IEP, if that's the, your child's case. Um, if it's on that services summary page, it must exist in that setting for your child. If it's not on that service summary page, then it isn't necessarily going to exist because it's not communicated to the rest of the IEP team. And if you believe that something should be in place, and I'll talk about this in a little bit, you need to request that to be on the IEP in writing. And you can go to the next slide. So modifications is a really important distinction in contrast to an accommodation. And it becomes terribly important at the high school level. This is the credit driven world of the high school and an accommodation is about access to the physical environment and to the curriculum. So that means that um, you know, in a physical setting, we have ramps and elevators for students with physical disabilities. Um, and then in a curriculum type of a sense, if, if a student uh, ha cannot access written material, then we have audiobooks, for example, for students. A modification has to do with adjusting the delivery or the content in such a way that it reduces the demand in depth, breadth, or complexity. And it changes the nature of the standard that is that the student is um, is trying to work toward, and if if a, a grade and a course is modified, that means that a modified grade will be issued, and that means that the student cannot qualify for a traditional or regular diploma, and it only takes one modified grade, um, unless you have a grade in that same course code that replaces that modified grade. So if you took algebra and you got a modified B, then you're on a modified diploma track. If you retake algebra and you get a, a regular passing grade, even a D, then that replaces that modified grade and then you can be on track for a regular diploma. But really important to pay attention to modifications. Okay, next slide. So I mentioned the range of services that 
you should expect to see. And there are, uh, there are degrees to all of this, but there should be a variety of opportunities for students on IEPs to receive their services. Sometimes it's pretty self-contained and sometimes students need, um, you know, uh, so many services and supports throughout the day that there's a special education teacher with that student for the majority of the day. Other times there are co-teaching opportunities and we really try to work toward that um, so that there are regular general education content area teachers teaching alongside special education teachers. And then you have a variety of students with a variety of academic levels in a course. And so you have the content expert and you have a, um, uh, an expert in instruction and they plan together and they teach together. And that's a great opportunity for all students to learn um, the content at a deeper level and make sure that there's access for all students. Then there's a the concept of uh, inclusion, mainstreaming. Um, a lot of people use those terms interchangeably and we have students in the general education classrooms and um, maybe there's co-planning or some information provided to the general education content teacher about individual students who are in that class. Um, a lot, there should be the expectation that there are education assistants, classified staff in elective classes to make sure that students have the proper access. Um, there might be support rooms, sometimes called support classes or resource room, where you can work on targeted skills or work completion. Um, and one thing about supports in place, by default, um, sometimes kids with disabilities who have IEPs are excluded from AP and honors courses and um, schools should really be careful about that. Now, there's, there's the nature of the depth of content in AP and honors that oftentimes um, Per, you know, inhibits the ability for a lot of students to access that type of content. But um, there are plenty of students on IEPs who should be in AP and honors courses. And, um, and sometimes, like I said, by default, they're just excluded because of their disability, which is against all kinds of laws, <laughs> just so you know. Um, okay, next slide. Okay, um, it is important, well, and actually this is the next section. So um, I should pause for a sec. Chris, were there any questions that happen to pop up? Well, I'll take a question that was sent to us earlier. In what ways is the transition to high school uniquely com complicated for students with high versus low incidence disabilities or severity? of disability, perhaps. So less severe and more yeah. severe. So I think I covered a little bit about that in that last part. Um, and that's where there should be this whole range of services. Like there shouldn't just be a special education program. And I think we, um, you know, in previous years, and we have done that in Springfield, so I'm not saying um, we've done things um, perfectly or better than anyone else, um, where we get lulled into that concept of services for students with disabilities, and here's what the program is. There has to be a range. There has to be a full cooperation between general education and content area teaching and the special education staff and opportunities for co-teaching, opportunities for students to be served in separate settings and everything in between. Because it is, it is complicated um, both for high incidence and more low incident disabilities because you have students you know, with um, a specific learning disability in particular academic areas who are really working for a regular diploma and um, you know, general education teaching staff not understanding differentiation necessarily and really um, inhibiting their ability to get toward a regular diploma. And then low incidence disabilities with such unique programming that it, that it requires a person with specialized skill and knowledge to make sure that there's the proper access 
and and really ensuring that the student has all the services that they need, especially when it comes to medical and physical, um, when it gets really complicated, um, motor, physical therapy, occupational therapy, and all the residual type of services that need to be in place to make sure that the student's as successful as possible. Um, and I'm gonna get a little bit more into that in the last section and the, um, the, the role of the parent in this, and a little bit in this request section too. Okay, Brian, I'm going to flow one, into that. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Can I ask one other question related to it? I think it's related. Do Oregon high schools allow for medical exercise therapies such as aqua physical therapy and uh, occupational therapy to count toward PE credits? So if you have a student that has limited function of legs and arms, wheelchair dependent, and has IEP shortened school day due to extreme fatigue, uh, can the PE be waived and filled with like uh, aqua PT or OT? I'm so, trying to understand the quick a answer lot to this question. I sent you this question no, so I you could look at it, but I think that's general. Yeah, I I love it because I've worked on this in a couple of cases and the quick answer is yes. And um, also you will get pushback, especially from PE teachers many times in this area, because it's not about waiving, it's about um, establishing what the PE standard is because there are state standards in PE, but um, depending on the interpretation and I have a looser interpretation about the PE standards and what accommodations would be, um, because physical limitations are a real thing and um, we cannot exclude students from being able to gain a PE credit because of uh, documented disability. So the quick answer is yes. You, you can use the, um, the work that they're doing in that area around physical therapy and occupational therapy to lead toward that standard and get a, a not modified, a regular P credit. There's just a little work to be done in that, but yes. And if that person happens to be on right now and they want to send me a separate email with some clarification, I'd be happy to, to field it. And then if you're part of a different district, I will probably um, <laughs> send you off with uh, some contact information. Because the other people, I will be quite clear, other people have a different opinion about um, students reaching that, that PE standard. So I'm going to flow into this concept around requests and I believe strongly that we should talk through issues, present concerns, hear from different members of teams and problem solve. We should do all of that in person. If you have a specific request for something, you need to put it in writing. Email is fine, but you need to put the request in specifically to the special education teacher, potentially the administrator, because it documents that you requested it and it um, prompts school level staff to respond to that request. And it's actually our responsibility to respond to requests. We have to take um, information and meaningful input from parents. And then <clears throat> um, we don't necessarily have to honor the request. The education plan and program is actually the school's responsibility to put into place and de develop and put into place and carry out. Um, and if your request is not honored, then you, this is my opinion, this is what you should do. And you'll get, um, you'll have varying levels of success at all these levels, but you need to go directly to the special education teacher. And if you don't have an adequate explanation about why a request is not honored, go to the school level administrator. And there's usually a, an assistant principal or principal that's in charge of special education. Then go to the special education office staff. That would be someone like me in a, in a special education administrator role. Then the superintendent, then start interfacing with the Oregon Department of Education. And a parent has every right to file a complaint with the ODE or request a due process hearing. Here's what I'll tell you, is that at that point, 
lawyers do get involved. And if you're expect, expecting resolution quickly, all of that goes away once lawyers are involved. And um, it's an unfortunate nature of the system, but you're talking months and a lot of times years to get things resolved when it starts to go through that legal system. Sometimes there's no way to resolve that conflict, but um, if you can keep it as a parent at the lowest level possible, you have more opportunity to solve problems in an expedient way. Brian, can um, I ask you a question really quickly? Yeah, of course. So then, so I imagine that your job, you're basically uh, uh, doing that, trying to resolve issues related to special education, approximately what percentage of your time? And secondly, how successful are you at doing that without moving to due process? Well, I'd, um, I guess the quick, in a normal time, I guess uh, about a third of my job would be helping to resolve building level disagreements. Um, and I would say very successful. And here's where it gets challenging though. And I'll, so I'll answer that portion of the question in a little different way. Um, I'm in this business for um, supporting students, which means that most of the time I am most interested in the opinion that a parent has about their child. And so that puts me at odds sometimes with my staff. <laughs> if they have a different opinion about how to resolve an issue. And so that's where there's a lot of challenges that um, we have to make sure that we abide by the laws and rules in special education. But then, um, you know, we have to really dig into what is realistic in the school setting. And, um, but if we can get past that and we know that both the teachers are there to help the student and the parents and family are there to help the student, almost all the time we get the issues resolved. And you know, always going that extra layer deep of trying to figure out what are we really asking for? You know, and, and actually I'll go back to the, the diploma options. Sometimes there are big arguments about diploma type. And what I really try to do is refocus to long-term objectives okay, your child wants to go into the military. Well, we better make sure that, um, you know, that a modif getting a modified diploma gets us to that place. You wanna to go to a trade school, you wanna continue in ed, in education. So um, making sure that we really have those common agreements and we know what we're arguing about. Um, and I think that's why we have been successful because, um, I think there is, you know, more and more a, a child focus and not what our system by default can accomplish. And you can go to the next slide. So there are a lot of words and they're a little smaller than I thought they were gonna be. Um, here's, if I were to recommend um, making requests immediately and this is applicable even though school has started i would definitely request a transition meeting coming into school and i this is more applicable for when we come back to school hopefully in january um, and if you were not here earlier yes i'm kind of a ridiculous optimist but i'm going to stay that way until january gosh darn it um, so Request a meeting prior to school starting, and um, I'll fall short of using the word demand, but general education teachers should be in that meeting. And, uh, you know, especially when there's going to be a level of participation in those content classes, gen ed teachers have to be there. And sometimes there are scheduling limitations. Schedule something separately with them then, because um, you in my opinion, it's terribly important for a parent and a student who has a disability to be in front of that gen ed teacher. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a little bit. You should look at the student handbook. You need to know what protections are in place 
in writing for students on IEPs from a district standpoint and what the district is, expresses in writing. And then um, make sure that you know who the, the, your single point of contact case manager counselor is going to be um, at least for that school year, because sometimes it changes year to year, which is just the nature of that system. It's the way it's gonna be. But again, I'll fall short a little bit of demanding, but there should be a person that you can reach out to and get a response, at least acknowledging that, that they received your correspondence. There should be one person that you can send an email to and expect a response within 24 hours. Um, and then you should have some sort of communication plan with that person that is either in writing or verbal that's regular consistent communication and frequent that is good for you but also you have to remember it's got to work with the school setting as well you you know we can't expect a response within an hour for example just because of the nature of the job okay next slide <clears throat> Okay, maybe a little too common, commonly used, but it never gets old for me because I never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. Margaret Mead, um, a great person in history. If you don't know who she is, you should look her up. Okay, next slide. So, team. So, I'm gonna start with the administrator. And technically, the administrator who oversees special education is the one who allocates resources. And that means that if you're requesting something that requires additional resource, um, you know, uh, physical therapy services, um, you know, additional education assistance supports in portions of the day, the administrator is the one who gets to allocate their resources and they should be at IEP meetings. The special education teacher case manager is responsible for the specially designed instruction and actually delivering that instruction and also supporting with any modifications if they exist and accommodations and communicating those to general education teaching staff. The parent and I'm going to go a little bit deeper into this is that you have one role and it is advocacy be empathetic but be tireless in your advocacy. Um, now, general education teachers, and this is an important one, they're responsible for providing content and including your child in the general education setting. Sometimes it's missed and lost on some of our general education teachers that it's their responsibility to include the child in the gen ed setting, not special education teachers. Um, you know, sometimes there are words that are used like those students or your student and the conversation has to be about our student, um, which brings me to the responsibility of the student. Their responsibility is everything. And I will cover this a little bit later too, that, um, boy, uh, I have a teenage daughter right now, she's 16 and wow, um, they're a funny group of people to deal with on a daily basis um, and uh, challenging in so many ways, but, and I don't think that they realize a lot of times that they are responsible for a significant portion of this education thing that's going on around them. So um, that's just something to keep in mind. All right, next slide. Okay, so that's the last part of that. And I have, um, you know, one other portion to go through and then, um, so were there any, I think you covered all three of those questions that came in earlier. And I didn't receive any in the chat box. Okay. So. Right. I'm not challenging anyone to submit questions. I'm talking an awful lot. Um, all right, you can, well, okay. Stay here for just a second. I just have to check something. I wanted to make sure I didn't miss something.
sorry for the pause. Hang on two seconds. Okay, go ahead, go to the next slide. All right, so I want to talk about this for a couple of seconds. And um, this is where, remember, I'm talking from Springfield School District perspective, my perspective as special programs director in this district. Um, but I do want to remind you that everyone else on the team has multiple roles. And the principal has a school of, you know, ranging from, you know, our smaller high schools in, in county in the state, you know, get into the couple hundreds, but, you know, a, a regular size high school in Lane County is 13, 14, 1500 students. They have a lot of things that they're worrying about and thinking through a lot of adults to manage. Special education teachers have uh, bigger caseloads than they should, um, you know, at any given time, in my opinion. Um, so everyone has these multiple roles. Parents have one, and you are the advocate. And sometimes it's, I'll use the word annoying. Um, and I don't mean that in any negative way. It's just, it's annoying to some people in the school setting because there's so much coming at them. And that's why I'm saying be empathetic, be um, kind as you're advocating for your child, but be tireless and relentless about advocating for your child. It's your responsibility. And it's a very short amount of time that you have in this IDEA special education law driven world because um, once a regular diploma is met, or age 21 comes, that is the end of the school setting for your, your child. Um, and, you know, don't punish the teachers and, um, and there's no reason to, um, you know, get kind of escalated and elevated with emotion, but it is necessary that when you demand uh, communication about something and you don't get the communication, then you remind people that I expected this communication and I should be receiving information back. Um, and on that note of communication, I, I really would encourage you to establish regular communication in writing with a, that point of contact. And then I would just ask really nicely of you parents to don't beat up folks at the school level for the communication that you do get back that you don't like. Because um, remember the, the thing that I talked about a, with efficiency with high school staff. If, if they're communicating back to you information about, sorry. Is that still for just a little bit too long? So if you're getting information back about say an incident that happened and it sounds accusatory of something that your student did or didn't do, um, just remember that there's an efficiency in that communication coming back to you. And, um, you know, so don't beat up the staff about uh, blaming your student only. These are high school teachers. They know that there were two sides of this interaction in most cases. And, um, so, and that's why I would say agree on a communication plan on the front end. And because if you want the information, then it's got to be efficient and it has to be efficient for the high school folks so they can pound out a quick email at the end of the day and shoot it off to you. And if they can do that without worrying about and they're getting thanked for that information rather than, well, thanks for that information. And um, I don't appreciate the words you used in these three instances, um, you're going to continue to get the information that you need fed to you as a parent to be the proper advocate and support for your child. So just keep that in mind, establish some communication norms on the front end and just insist on that regular communication. Um, also, try to narrow down, if you're asking for something specific, really try to narrow down on what you're asking for. Um, and I would recommend asking for um, you know, if you're asking for a series of, you know, you need these 10 things in place, ask for a couple or three that are the most important to you first. And, um, and again, that's, you're going to get um, better results with school staff, in my opinion. 
Um, okay, go to the next slide. And I'm going to do a quick rundown of six things that you should kind of dig deeper on and be ready to talk about. And I think this does apply to coming back to school, even though, you know, we're not in September before school started. Um, check to see if the site's available for um, a, a visit prior to school resuming. It's, it's really necessary for so many students, regardless of a documented disability, to have a connection to that physical site. Find out about meal times, where, when, and how meals are served. Are there unique needs regarding food or socializing or being in large group settings or, you know, what about that lunchtime experience is important for you to know so that your student can be properly supported. Learn about extra extracurricular activities. Um, school is supposed to be fun, actually, <laughs> good portions of it. And there are a lot of um, uh, activities that are taking place and opportunities to connect with peers, both peers with, um, with disabilities and students without disabilities. And um, it's important to have those connections in and outside of the school setting. So find out about those. Next slide. Um, learn about additional ninth grade supports. There is a potential that there are supports that are specifically in place for ninth graders or 10th graders that you may not know about as a parent and maybe even your child knows about them and you don't know about them yet. So inquire about those maybe with your child first, but then for sure with some school personnel. Don't disregard how difficult the high school is for all kids and your kid. Um, check in with them about stress and, um, and feeling overwhelmed about, you know, both, um, you know, anything that's going on, at, on academically, but also with, um, with peers. And find out what mental health services are available at the school. A lot of times there are some um, counseling and, and mental health services that are uh, low cost, no cost, and you can get direct referrals from the counselor at the high school to mental health services. Uh, we have a lot of those available in Springfield and I know in surrounding districts as well. And um, I think sometimes people believe the facade that, yep, everything is okay when it's not. So pay attention to that. Also, transition services. So um, students on IEPs, we are obligated to provide services through age 21 or a regular diploma. And so that band of 18 to 21 years old um, is really an important time where we get to, you know, really solidify the skills that need to be in place before the student transitions into a post-secondary, again, outside of this IDEA-driven world where we're responsible for um, providing these services. And um, a lot of times these services are associated with vocational rehabilitation through Department of Human Services, and they're really valuable services that can be provided in that, um, as that student transitions. And so now would be a good time to ask about them. And there's part of the IEP, once the student turns 16, there have to be transition services in the IEP, but they can be discussed before the student turns 16. And, and you can inquire about that. And it's just, um, Regardless of whether you think that a regular diploma is going to happen or you expect services to continue through age 21, it's just a, um, it's a terribly important time to gain all the skills from everything from dressing and hygiene to, um, you know, resumes and, and getting jobs and applying for uh, post-secondary education. All right, next slide. Okay. I saved this slide for last because this is hard. It almost brings a tear to my eyes and anyone who has a, a teenager will know this, that um, your child is going to be the age of majority very soon. At age 18, there is a line that happens and either um, that student is their own parent and they have all the education rights or um, education rights are continued through you 
through um, proper paperwork. But by default, that child becomes their own supervising adult. And it's happening soon. My daughter is 16 and, and I, it's just right over that little hump. So start thinking about it right now and your child and, you know, a lot of times I get, um, you know, limitations thrust upon your children, our students, and um, I find it unacceptable. All students should be participating in their IEP process. They're the ones on a day-to-day -day basis who are sitting in that education setting. They know more about it than maybe anyone. And so they should be involved in the IEP process. They should be directly involved in communication with special education and general education teachers. Um, so anything you can do to foster that, that connection of that student with their services is just terribly important. And I think maybe the most important piece as they take more and more ownership to their education and thinking about that transition. And look, I don't expect, I didn't figure out what in the world I was gonna do until really late in the game. Um, and it was a whole series of events that led, it, led to uh, you know, being in special education and it's the best decision that I think I have ever made. And I'm super happy to be here, but it was late in the game. And so if, if your child ends up deciding later what they want to do and what they want to be and and how they want to contribute that's fine but they have to be involved in every step of the way and again this is my opinion and it's a strong opinion about it though because i've seen it over and over again where when students are involved their level of success increases dramatically all right that is my rambling content um, I tried to put it in little sections so that it was digestible. So I hope, hope it was. Um, that is my email address. I think it's going to be thrown into the chat. Um, I'm happy to, to attempt to answer questions on that I believe. Um, of course, if, if, if your child's in Springfield, then I will definitely point you in the right direction. But if they're not, then I'll try to get contact info for, for your district. And thanks so much for spending time with me this evening. I still don't have any questions. One thing that uh, we do just before anyone leaves is in the chat box, we're going to put a little uh, uh, evaluation. And we use, you know, part of this is through our center. Our center has federal funding and we use these evaluations to continue to offer things like this. Uh, so that evaluation is in the chat box now. If anyone has any questions, uh, you, can, you can write them in there. I had a question, Brian. Okay. What is the best, do you, you know, a lot of the, the communication you were talking about between parents and teachers, you were, uh, you were kind of saying, you know, parents should be empathetic and they should understand that the teachers are very busy and uh, sometimes have to respond in efficient ways. Do you have any, uh, like, and by the way, I was a high school special education teacher too. So are there any surefire kind of ways or plans that you've seen that seem like uniquely good for exchanging information between school and home? You know, like a plan, you were saying communication plan. Are there some that are better than others, like some kind of written document or email, like a table that might have information on it that gets shared back and forth? Well, <laughs> You know, the thing that I encourage my special education teachers to do is um, use what works for the family and then, um, and just make sure that it's documented. I, I have some families that, um, you know, there are just communication apps on the phone. It's just like texting, but everything is just saved. Um, and that's just important for the safety of, the, of both the parents and the teacher. 
So using a text-like app that is um, somewhat secure, but efficient for the, the parent and the, the teacher, and that the teacher, frankly, can turn off over the weekend because that is definitely their right to do that. Um, and, but at this point, I think nothing beats email because it's, it's documented, it's, um, it's pretty efficient. Um, you're not gonna get a hold of a teacher midday by, in, in that way, but uh, there are always avenues to get a hold of a teacher if, it's, if something is more in the emergency nature where, um, and you should have avenues for both from a parent standpoint. But that regular communication should be um, through district email is the number one thing that I would say. But a lot of teachers have, have agreements with parents and they, they use those apps and they agree to, to check that communication app every couple of hours, um, especially when kids have more low incidence disabilities and there are um, you know, medication and um, doctor appointment type of issues. Any questions? I don't. I still don't have any. <laughs> Brian, so one crystal thing, clear. Uh, I think I've known you for about uh, thirteen or fourteen years now, and one thing that I would say is that you have been consistently dedicated and supportive of high expectations and high standards for students for as long as I've known you. And uh, that's a very unique thing that, you know, I know a lot of administrators that get worn out and beaten down, a lot of teachers that get worn out and beaten down, but you uh, still today are the same as when I met you 13 years ago about your optimism and support of students and families. So I appreciate you doing this for us. Uh, it was very nice. And hopefully we'll, we'll have you back next year to do something different, you know, a different topic. I don't really have any questions coming through on the chat box. So I think, uh, I think that's it. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity and the kind words. Um, and gosh, I, what do we have but optimism, right? So I appreciate you saying that. All right. Thank you all for coming too. Uh, there are a lot of familiar people online here. And uh, thank you all for joining us. Thanks, everyone. Take care.